Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot back with you on the Typologetics YouTube channel with my wife May, uh, ready to read. Our subject, Source Criticism of the Bible. Boy, is that controversial. We'll talk a little more about it and continue to explore it a bit. Discuss again the reason for that. Let's open with prayer. Father, teach us in all things to uh, speak the truth in love and build up others in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been studying this even though um, most believers won't directly deal with uh, scholarship having to do with the sources of the Bible text. But when uh, students in college do happen to take studies that touch on this and then find it surprising, or when a witness is being given to a person who does happen to have some knowledge about this and questions come up, it is important to understand something about it. And what we're dealing with now, having seen that under inspiration, writers in the New Testament combined uh, previous documents, conflated them, conflated uh, you know, scripture texts in small ways and large ways in order to achieve the inspired text that we, we have, we're now going to look back in the Old Testament, and here's where the controversy really comes in. Because the New Testament, in several places, calls the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, uh, individual verses are uh, quoted from those as being written or spoken by Moses. And spoken just being a, a way of saying written by Moses. And yet scholars, beginning in the Middle Ages, but even uh, more so, uh, even more so, of course, about 150 years ago, after the Enlightenment, uh, scholars began to see places in those first five books that don't seem to make sense as having been uh, written by Moses, that is, someone in his time, in the particular place where Moses, uh, where, where Moses is put uh, by the text itself, uh, and saying that it looks like there were other authors involved in writing these books. So it seems to set up a contradiction. Well, no, you know, the New Testament says Moses wrote all that. So what we've been looking at is, is that really necessarily a contradiction? And we haven't looked at that evidence yet. But what we have been looking at is many, many examples where a person is said to have done something, and then we find that the action that they did it, or the best evidence we have is they did it in a very indirect way. Sometimes they did not even, uh, that it was not even part of their will or decision to have it done. So we looked at Abraham's purchase of a burial plot in Shechem, which was done through his grandson long after he was dead. We looked at Judas Iscariot being said to have purchased a piece of property, even though the only connection was that his money was used. And we've looked at several others in the Old and New Testament. So there are cases where a person is, you know, said to have done something, but we find that it, it was a highly, it was in a highly indirect way. Sometimes they just uh, started a process that ended up with something getting done. We saw that in the case of Elijah too. Um, but some people will say, oh, but that's not talking about writing. The act of writing is somehow different from that. So what we were looking at is in Matthew chapter 27. We were looking at this example of Judas Iscariot um, and this uh, purchase attributed to him in Acts. Um, but there's something interesting about the scripture that's quoted. We read this last time, but we're going to uh, read it again to uh, reorient ourselves here. So may, if you would read verses uh, 9 and 10 of Matthew 27. So this is kind of the end of Matthew's account about what happened to Judas Iscariot. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel. And they give them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Okay. So you got, now, Matthew says this was written by whom? Or he says spoken, but who? Uh, the, um, prophet. Which Jeremiah. prophet? Jeremiah. Now, he says spoken by Jeremiah, mm -hmm. but we know that means written. I mean, Jeremiah, you know, it's not as if 
uh, Jeremiah spoke it and then it was handed down orally by word of mouth. I mean, Jeremiah had been dead for six centuries, you know, when Matthew uh, wrote this. Uh, but just spoken means written. So, you know, we have several instances where the Bible says, Moses said, mm -hmm. uh, meaning Moses wrote. You know, there's one in Mark, there's uh, one in Acts chapter 3, there's one in Romans chapter 10. You know, all you have to do is use a concordance and you can find them. So, so spoken here uh, just means that it's written. And it is clear that Matthew is saying that Jeremiah wrote these words or something substantially like them. The problem is in the book of Jeremiah as we have it, there is nothing very close to this scripture that's given. It's closer to a scripture in Zechariah. <laughs> We're going to look at that. But even there, the connection is very loose. But for example, in my NASB study Bible, it gives three different places in Jeremiah where there is something remotely like this verse. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord said. So we'll take a quick look just to see. The first one, they listed Jeremiah 19, 1 through 13. So let's look back in our Old Testament to Jeremiah 19, and we won't read the entire section. We'll just get a flavor for it. So 19, and it says verses 1 through uh, 13, but let's just start off by uh, reading verses 1 and 2. Thus is the Lord, go and buy a potter's earthenware jar and take some of the elders of the people and some of the senior priests. Then go out to the valley of Ben Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the, potter, the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I tell you. Okay, and basically what he says then is that he will he's going to destroy and bring a terrible judgment and destruction on the city of Jerusalem for their long history of unfaithfulness to God. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a, a terrible, terrible prophecy. Uh, and may, if you would read verses, say, uh, 10, and, uh, 10 through 12. Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany you, and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Just so I will break this people and this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessels, which cannot again be repaired, and they will bury in Tophet, because there is no other place for burial. All right, and then verse 12. This is how I will treat this place and its inhabitants, declares the Lord, so as to make this city like Tophet. Okay. So here's the thing. There's the connection of a potter, because he tells them to go and buy a potter's jar. And then there's a connection with a piece of property, just that he's to go out to uh, the Valley of Ben Hinnom, uh, which is uh, down, it's this is like the south, the southeast, uh, uh, southeast uh, directly of the city of Jerusalem, if I'm remembering my geography correctly. Uh, he's going to break this in this particular tract. So there is a tract of land that's involved. Uh, and then this breaking of this jar is, as in effect, the nation's going to be broken. It is, you know, th th those are very vague connections to what we read. They took 30 pieces of silver. There's nothing about 30 pieces of silver. Uh, there's nothing about setting a price. There's nothing about giving them for the potter's field. There really isn't even a potter's field here. There's just a potter and a tract of land, uh, you know, that you might call a field, but it's not even called a field. But it's, it's only the vaguest uh, connection to the subject of, 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 of pottery and, and of a particular piece of land. That's all we've got. Okay, so we'll look at the next one. Uh, 18, uh, Jeremiah uh, 18, so back uh, 2 through 12. So just back up a chapter. Um, what verse? And so read 
verses two through uh, two through four, say. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there was, making something on the whale. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Okay, so God is saying that, you know, his purpose, if his purpose toward them was for good things, mm -hmm. but then they proved unfaithful, it was like a, a vessel that had been spoiled, so then it's reshaped and there was the destiny of the nation could be reshaped according to, you know, their faithfulness or lack of faithfulness. God says he's like the potter. You know, we have Paul in the book of Romans drawing upon this illustration of God being the potter. Uh, but aside from, you know, again, we have a, a, a potter's field in verse 7, back of Matthew 27. It says, uh, with the money they bought the potter's field, but then he quotes the verse about the 30 pieces of silver. It's just the figure of the potter here in Jeremiah. Again, is the only connection, but there's no direct connection with with the word or directly with the thought that Matthew is quoting. So the last possibility is Jeremiah 32, 6 through 9. So so Jeremiah 32 and uh, yeah, we'll go, go ahead and read that one. It's probably the closest that we have to what we read in Matthew. So we'll, we'll see what it says. Okay. What's verse? Uh, uh, six through nine. Six. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle is coming to you, saying, Buy for yourself my field, which is at an thought, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard according to the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for you have the right of position and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field which was at Anathoth from Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weigh out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. Okay, so here is our closest verse. It is about um, buying a field and uh, sealing the deed in a jar. Uh, and the point of this uh, prophecy is that God said, in spite of the destruction that is coming upon Jerusalem, that at some day in the future, God would restore them, and that even though the land had been devastated and desolated, that once again, you know, the nation would revive and fields would be bought, uh, you know, uh, the fields would be planted, the nation would become prosperous again, it would be replanted on its land and prosper. So, I mean, the context of it is quite vastly different from uh, Judas's money being uh, you know, used to buy a potter's field uh, and, and Judas' suicide, you know, there's sort of an implication maybe he was buried in that field, you know, and then we have more information in that vein in, in Acts written by Luke. But uh, the point is here, the only resemblance really is the purchasing of a field and a, 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 maybe a potter's jar being involved in the action but it's clearly not in the way that is being described by the verse that Matthew is quoting. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, the theme of the potter or a role of a potter keeps coming up in Jeremiah. And the idea of a purchase of a field, of certain tracts of land being involved in destruction and then redemption and restoration. Those ideas are present in Jeremiah, but that's only uh, vaguely connected, not directly connected with what Matthew says. So what about going outside of Jeremiah? 
uh, because uh, this uh, 30 pieces of silver, we do have something in Zechariah. So Zechariah 11, 12 to 13. So let's go there. So that's uh, the last, uh, near the end of the Minor Prophets, uh, near the end of the Old Testament. Yeah, Zechariah. So that was uh, 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 12, let me say 12, 11 and 12. Uh, now I've got to uh, look at it again, though. Momentarily <laughs> lost track of it mentally. Let's what? just look back here. I'll tell you. Okay. So, uh, excuse me, Zechariah 11. So it's 11, 12 to 13, not 12. Okay. So, may, if you could go ahead and read that for us. I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weigh out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Okay, so this is closer. It's not in Jeremiah at all, in Zechariah, but it says that a God uh, says, this is the magnificent price that I have been uh, valued by them, the price of a slave, approximately 30 pieces of silver. So there is the 30 pieces of silver. It is sort of a price put on a God in some way or on their relationship with God. There is throwing them uh, to the potter in the house of the Lord. There's nothing about a, 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 you know, a, a, a potter's field which uh, Matthew says, uh, for the potter's field. That's not really in uh, Zechariah. Um, and in fact, as Matthew quotes the verse, he says, the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them, they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Um, he doesn't say through them, uh, but he does have the throwing. That is, Matthew has the action of Judas is said to be throwing them. He throws the, the uh, 30 pieces to the chief priests and elders. And it says he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary. So this throwing action, uh, like we find in Zechariah, um, it says, uh, and, and the house of the Lord, the sanctuary, that's in verse 13. So the act of sort of throwing the, the money is in Matthew, but not quoted in the verse, actually. It's just in the action Matthew describes. And the 30 pieces of silver as a valuation somehow on God, you know, a low valuation being put on the Lord here, that idea is present. But Matthew seems to kind of synthesize, if we can uh, use that word, he kind of synthesizes thoughts about the importance of certain tracts of land in Jerusalem, the importance of the potter, kind of a sy symbolic aspects of the potter, uh, you know, potter's field, th that's kind of drawing on Jeremiah a bit and sort of blending some of those ideas with this verse in Zechariah and coming up with uh, sort of a, a, a distilled or conflated uh, essence drawn from these books, uh, but then is attributed to them. But he, here's the point. He, he says that this was written by Jeremiah when the most we could say really is that Jeremiah provided some inspiration. If, if we can look, you know, uh, and almost literally, uh, that is the imagery used by Jeremiah under the uh, uh, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, is being drawn out by Matthew and applied to this situation and formulated into a verse. You know, just, just taking these ideas out and attributing them back. But it's, again, it's, we would not, in our way of speaking, normally say that Jeremiah wrote this. But He's saying Jeremiah had something to do with this idea and this event that came about. There's a connection between Jeremiah and 
Zechariah, although it's not mentioned, but uh, a later writer, you know, Jeremiah wrote something and the later writer, writer added something. And now this thought is being, Jeremiah is being credited for it, even though, like I say, it just wouldn't be our way of talking to, to credit him by saying that he wrote this. And yet it does say he wrote it. All right. And so that's why when, if we go back, into the, the five books of Moses and we start looking at the evidence and the evidence is strong of some other authorship, of some later authorship, of some editing, of some combining of sources, uh, you know, uh, depending exactly on what is being claimed there, if, the, if the, that evidence is good, we cannot use the words about Moses said and Moses wrote as absolutely excluding those possibilities because over and over again, the Bible uses terms like that credit so indirectly. In other words, if Moses had something to do with it, it can be credited to him. If he got the ball rolling, it can be credited to him. If God told him to write things. I mean, we had God, uh, in, in a previous couple of studies, we had God telling Elijah, go to the region of Damascus, anoint Hazael. Elijah, a faithful prophet of God, did not do that the way that we would normally expect him to do that. Instead, he anointed his successor, who many years later <laughs> then went to Damascus and told Hazael that he would be king over Syria, resulting in Hazael finally, uh, you know, uh, assassinating, you know, his lord and becoming king of Syria. That's not at all how we would picture the command of God to Elijah being fulfilled. We wouldn't normally leave room for that kind of obedience or that kind of fulfillment of God's command to Elijah, yet we just cannot deny, well, you can deny anything. You know, you can try to say that even though the Bible didn't say it, that Elijah actually went to Damascus uh, completely, the scriptures are silent about it, but he went to Damascus and he anointed his ale, and then years and years later, Elisha went there and performed this action and uh, and, and that's not even the real fulfillment of it, that Elijah had done it directly. I mean, you can insist that if you want. I think it just is completely a not, you know, it just does not make sense of the biblical evidence we have. Instead, it's this idea of arm's length, uh, uh, arm's length attribution. And if you remember, since we're in Matthew, just turn over a few pages, refresh, refresh our memories again. As we were looking at this when we were talking about conflation to Mark, to Mark chapter 1. So we're in, if you just, we're in Matthew 27. Go over to Mark chapter 1. The very first couple of verses. So we had this a couple studies ago. But let's just refresh our memory about it. May Please read um, verses 2 and 3 of Mark 1. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Okay. So if you remember, we uh, saw that although it says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, only a part uh only just a part of what follows is from Isaiah. So at least here we have a little uh, sentence, uh, make way the ready of the, uh, the way of the Lord. It says, uh, um, actually, Isaiah says the voice of one crying, make ready the way of the Lord in the wilderness, you know? So it even turns that those words around a little bit. But it's actually a conflation of Exodus, of Isaiah, of Malachi. So even here, it's simply not literally the case that Isaiah wrote uh, these words as Mark has them, but 
he is attributing it to Isaiah because Isaiah supplies a key thought for it. And so, so again, we saw that there are other examples. We uh, looked at an example by Paul where he says, the scripture says, and then he blends about four scriptures, you know. <laughs> but he, he quotes it, Paul quotes that, I was in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe. Paul quotes it as if it's a single scripture and it's a conflation of several scriptures. So even you could say that's a little misleading according to the way that we would normally speak. So all of this just goes back to the question, well, you, you just cannot say, because it says Moses wrote this, that Moses directly wrote it. You can't even say that Mo it means, well, Moses had to dictate it. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't even say, well, it means that Moses literally wrote 99% of it. Okay, well, could it be 95%? Could it be 90%? Could it be 80%? <laughs> you know, the, well, as we saw in the case of, of Isaiah here, it's maybe like, you know, 40%. I don't know if you parse out these words. In the case of Jeremiah, it's like a, a couple of vague images. You know, I don't know how you assign a percentage of how much Jeremiah contributed to the verse in Matthew 27, and yet he is credited with it. So we have to look at the strength of the evidence to decide whether there are multiple hands, whether there are, is even time going by in which words are added, but somewhere at the head of it, Moses played a role, a key role in somehow bringing this all about. Scripture definitely opens up that as a possibility. So let's, before we conclude, let's go back to what some of the particularly Jewish rabbis noticed in the books of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. And first of all, let's just go back to 33 for a moment and quickly, just verse 1. So may, if you would read uh, Deuteronomy 33, just read verse 1 for us. He said, the Lord came from Sinai. Uh, this is Deuteronomy 33, hmm. verse 1. Verse 1. Now this is the blessing with which Moses... Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, now this is the blessing which, with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. Okay. So there is a song or a poem, the blessing of Moses... It is sort of a second, uh, a kind of second edition of the blessing of um, Jacob on his sons back in Genesis, uh, chapter, uh, I think it's 49, the way you'll find that, 48, 49 of Genesis. You can look that up. It's sort of revisiting that, but this time it's Moses on the tribes rather than Joseph on his sons, who are the forefathers of the tribes. And then after he finishes with this blessing, his sort of final word, now we get to 34, and may I'll read a little of this, and we'll have you read some of it too. Now Moses, this, so this is 34, uh, verse 1. Now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negev, the plain in the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And he says, this is the land. This is the land I was going to give. I'm going to summarize now. Um, Moses died there. God buries him. No one knows where he's buried. Uh, so may, read verse 6. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beer Peor. Beth Peor. Mm -hmm. Beth Peor. But no man, but no man knows his burial place to this day. Okay, uh, no one, no man knows his burial place to this day. So it's clearly this is being written from some perspective in the future. So the idea that even Moses was inspired to, you know, write an account in advance about his own death. Well, it would be an extremely deceptive kind of writing about his own death because it, it takes a hypothetical point from some point in the future looking back and says, to this day, no one knows. And it implies, I would say, even a significant passage of time has gone by and no one has discovered, you know, it's clear that there's no marker, there's nothing to be discovered that would clue anyone in as to where Moses is buried. And if we go down to 
It says that Joshua, the Spirit of God, became operative on him to fill the role of Moses. And then, May, if you would uh, read verses 10 through 12. Since that time, no prophet has risen in the Israel, Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants and all his land, and all for and for, and all. for all the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Okay, so again we have a, a time reference looking back. Mm -hmm. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And I would even say, although it's not directly stated, uh, that there is an implication that there have been other prophets uh, that have arisen in the meantime. Uh, but it says no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses uh, because the Lord knew, knew him face to face. That's not like a typical prophet uh, that he performed these signs and wonders like the plagues on Egypt. That's also not the kind of typical thing of the closest thing would be later Elijah and maybe Elisha, you know, a couple of miracle working prophets, a few other miracles associated with prophets, but not dramatic miracles, ex like I said, except for those two, but even them not to the extent that was true of Moses. The, the reason I say that is because tradition says that, well, uh, Joshua wrote this last part, but you'll notice that, the, I mean, there's no note which Joshua could have said, now I, Joshua, the spirit became op operative upon me and Moses, this is what happened with him. Uh, you know, it just picks up, it leaves the reader with the distinct impression that this is all part of one book and one writing. Um, and uh, so that, that would be also be a little bit deceptive. Joshua just picks up as if it's the, the same author, as if there's, you know, there's no break in attribution here. And then the other thing is, like I said, that it, it seems to at least imply some sufficient time has gone by to compare Moses with what has happened to the nation over, you know, over a, probably a period of at least a couple of generations or so to see that in, in that time, no one has arisen that's anything like Moses. So the ascription to Joshua is understandable. Joshua follows Moses. You know, the next thing is we know Joshua. So, so to say, well, maybe it was Joshua who wrote this. I mean, that seems kind of a natural assumption to make because even Joshua is identified here as the one who's equipped then to take over leading Israel into the promised land, to kind of taking over Moses' leadership role. But the time distance is not a very natural fit for Joshua immediately following Moses. Even at the end of his life, you don't find in the you know, find, find the book of Joshua really um, much in the way of other prophets who might form some standard of comparison. Because we know that later other prophets would come who could be compared to Moses uh, and give them a sort of a way of seeing the greatness of Moses in, compared, in comparison with prophets, even true prophets, uh, that were more typical of the ones that God would send to the nation. So it raises a question, it can't help but raise a question that if this account doesn't uh, make sense as having been written by Moses, what about some other places? We'll look at those next time because our time is up right now. So let's close with prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for the precious treasures of your word. Help us with our understanding and guide our steps until we're together again. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Please uh, give us your likes and comments. Come back because this will be an interesting discussion going forward. And we will see you here.